an entrepreneur. I run a biomedical laboratory at the Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine, which is located in Bangalore. And I deeply believe that like, we can add so much value to the society by using the research and innovation. My lab at instead, we primarily focused on clinical translational research, where we developed innovative biotechnologies, biomaterials, and bioengineering concepts for solving unmet clinical needs. And we developed a gamut of technologies to improve the quality of life of people. Right? So over the decade of uh, experience in the clinical translational research, I came up with the four critical rules which plays a major role in practicing clinical translational research successfully. Today, I'm going to share all those four rules with you, and I'll take one of our recent innovation as an example to walk you through these rules. And rule number one, identify an unmet clinical need. It is absolutely critical to identify a right problem to solve, because when you spend your time, resources, money on it, you need to solve a what problem. Right? And make sure that you should develop a technology which not merely adds an incremental value to the existing solution, but rather make a breakthrough technology which brings the disruptive nature to solve the problem. Right? When you're talking about the developing technologies for unmet needs, then the question comes, should we focus on global needs versus local needs? Either of them are fine. So why you can contribute to solve both problems I personally feel uh, one need to focus on local problems too, where you can use the deep innovation to solve your local problems, where you can improve the quality of life uh, of people who live in your neighborhood, your state, your city, and country, and so on. Then the question comes like, you know, what kind of problem one select, right? And as a scientist, we get into a trap like where we try to identify problems which comes into our comfort zone. Right? where we can add the value immediately. But uh, here we should make an informative decision, thinking that like, you know, instead of like, what is our capability, going after the problem which is really worth to solve. So if you have to stretch your comfort zone, do it so. Or collaborate with people who can bring the multidisciplinary approach to solve these problems. So one of the recent examples I, like, uh, I will uh, tell you like, oh, what is the innovation we have made. As you know, like Indian farmers, they use almost like a 42,000 metric tons of pesticides every single year. And they spray these pesticides and they get exposed to it. And you know, like all these pesticides are highly toxic, especially neurotoxins. That's why when people get exposed, they have severe uh, toxicity and lethality and so on. So we thought like we'll focus on solving this problem. And, but when you say like, uh, these pesticides are only Indian farmers are using? No, right? It's a one way people use it. But if you see the farming practices in developed countries versus developing countries, they are very different. Because if you take an average farmer in developed countries, they own massive land, right? Because of that, they can adopt the state of the technologies like you know drones and planes or the huge machinery to spray all these types of pesticides. So because of that, your manual exposure is highly minimized, right? But on the contrary, if you see a farmer from India or developing countries, they use this uh, because they cannot adopt uh, larger machineries because on average, they hold very small amount of land per person, right? So because of that, like they cannot afford high-end technologies, they use this manual pumps to spray this pesticide, right? And without having any protective gear so. It's like, like almost like walking under the poison spray and it falls on their skin and they inhale and that's why they into huge toxicity. So then we decided like can we you know put our resources to solve this problem? But like you need to validate the need what you are identifying whether it's the right, the right one or not. So what we thought is like you know then as any scientists do like you know you go back and check the what is the conventional information that are already been existing about this pesticide toxicity. And what the conventional literature suggests so far is like, you know, people get exposed to these pesticides over a period of several years in a chronic manner, then they start showing a mild toxicity. That's what, what the information says. But like, you know, as any good scientist, you have to go and validate yourself to see whether what's the ground reality. So we wanted to go and do that. For that, 
our entire team, we went to like, you know, visited almost 60 villages uh, in Kalangana state. And we spent almost more than eight months to interact with more than 200 farmers and visit to their field to see like what kind of pesticide they spray and do they use any protective measures at all? If not, like what kind of level of exposure they have and what kind of side, side effect they are uh, facing. I believe like that's one of the best decisions we have ever made because that changed the perception of the pesticide toxicity that is existing today. As conventional uh, information, what suggests is people get exposed to so all the chronic clinic several years, then they see the wide effect. But the reality is completely opposite because the day they spray pesticide, from the same evening they start showing the acute uh, toxicity. Depending on the level of exposure people have, they start having the vomiting, fever, diarrhea, breathing disorders. If you have more exposure, it can lead to the convulsions and tremors and unconsciousness and so on. This is so painful that like, uh, uh, since there is absolutely no technology to protect themselves, they adopt other uh, stuff like, you know, they even uh, consume alcohol to come to the work because to just to bear the pain because there is no other means to protect themselves. This is really a, a pathetic situation which there was no innovation has been uh, done to protect these farmers. So, uh, and if I tell you, like, not only this uh, minimum toxicity, but like when you have the repeated exposures, the larger doses, this can lead to the death. Just to give an example, just in 2017, in the span of few months, in one district in Maharashtra, there were more than 60 people lost their lives, and more than 1,000 farmers hospitalized just by uh, getting acute exposure to this pesticide while spraying in the cotton field. That shows the need that exists to solve the problem and is screaming at us to solve this problem. And because we all fall in, right, like for various reasons, that is part of our life. But uh, people getting exposed to this pesticide as a part of occupational hazard which can put their lives at risk is completely unacceptable, right? So that's where we thought this is a really great need where, where we can go after and solve that problem. So that brings to our second rule, right? That is build a stellar team. Because developing biomedical technology is a no one man job, right? Like so you need to have a stellar, like a multidisciplinary team because you need to have people with a different backgrounds, different expertise. So we build a team at an uh, instant, like consists of chemists, biologists, biotechnologists, biomedical engineers, and so on. And, like, uh, and we regularly work with the clinicians on a daily basis to identify the needs and get their input to develop these technologies. So fast forwarding a few years, with a great effort of these people and with the fantastic collaborators, we have developed the technology. This is a, a skin gel. We came up with a skin gel which can use like your daily moisturizer. Apply on the skin before they go and spray the pesticide. So this skin gel acts as a chemical season. So it chemically go and deactivate all the pesticide, break down into non-harmful products, so that before that entering into the body, so that they can no longer cause the toxicity. So then like uh, we have set up a high benchmark to perform this gel, because as you know, like uh, pesticides, there are hundreds of types of pesticides that are available in the market. And farmers generally, they can't make an informed decision, okay, this gel works for this pesticide. They can't even read most of the labels, right? So that's why it's absolutely critical to think from your end, point, uh, end user point of view. And that's why we develop one single gel which can act for all of them. It can deactivate all of the pesticides that's available today. And not only that, if you see like, you know, all these farmers, they do farming in hot summer, cold winters. That means your gel should be active in the entire uh, temperature uh, range. So that we have developed. And not only that, uh, again, like, you know, mostly these farmers, they work under sunlight, right, in the open field. And most of these chemicals are getting, uh, they get destroyed uh, in sunlight in, through UV. So that's why it was challenging to develop the molecule which be stable under this UV light and still do the job. So by putting all these parameters one by one, we have developed this topical gel, which is robust enough to protect from farmers from pesticide induced toxicity. Then we went and tested their ability to really prevent the such toxicity. For example, as you know, like you know, when you have the repeated exposure to the pesticide, that can lead to the death. So to show that like this gel is active, we developed this rodent animal models where in the absence of the gel, if you repeatedly exposed to this pesticide, they kill almost all the animals. But whereas even if you have a single layer of the gel, 
and you keep repeatedly exposed to pesticide for almost a week, it still can protect 100%. It shows the robustness of the gels to protect from pesticide-induced lethality. Similarly, as you know, a farmers, it's a farming, it's uh, required a high physical activity, right? They cannot afford to uh, take a day off. And all these pesticides, primarily what they do is once they enter into the body, they damage your uh, neurons uh, and neuromuscular functions. So once you get exposed, like these people cannot do any muscle functions. Their entire neuromuscular function goes bad, and because of that, they cannot do any physical activity. So that leads to the entire loss of their productivity and so on. So then again, like uh, we have shown that by using this uh, topical gel, you can completely prevent such a loss of physical uh, endurance. And interestingly, again, if you see, as you, we are sitting here, like if I want to move my body or like my hand, I, my brain actively should send the signal, right? So then only I, I see the neuronal signal to have it. But like uh, that's how if you see uh, in your left where your healthy person never got exposed to the press side, if, if you measure the neuronal activity, you see like a straight line because they are not really moving your hand. But a person who got exposed to the press side, the farmer, so if you measure the same neuronal activity, even if he's not actively moving the hand, you can see the signals. That means your internal neurons are actually on fire, you know, because of the press side induced damage of this neuronal system. So uh, that's one of that's why they use the control on the muscles, right? Like when people get exposed to idosis, they have this uncontrollable shaking and tremors and convulsions because of this reason. And we showed that by using this technology, we can completely protect such uh, toxicity. So then we were like pretty happy that like you know we developed a technology which can apply it on the skin and potentially can prevent all the pesticide induced exposure. But before we celebrate, you know, that's where the, your third rule comes into picture. Uh, that is, uh, in fact, like, uh, just comes back to this, like, uh, as I mentioned, this is how you have involuntary movements when you get exposed to uh, pesticides, right? That's how you have the most. So the third rule in, in the uh, translational research is stakeholder, get the stakeholders feedback. Because uh, although from scientist's point of view, it worked, technically it worked very well, right? But you have to go to the end user and get their feedback. Can they adopt this technology? And what are the do's and don'ts? Whether they have the compliance? So for that, like uh, what we have done is we developed all these prototypes, which can be used for human, and went to farmers and displayed these prototypes and interacted with you know Krishnamala farmers, where thousands of farmers visit, and got the feedback. And that was again like uh, very eye-opening for us. While they appreciated our effort to develop this technology to protect. But like they did ask, like uh, that's great, you can apply in the skin, it can protect. But every single time they spray uh, pesticides, if they have to apply all over the body. So some people might not be comfortable and your compliance rate might go down. So that made us think, I think we need to make the alterations in our design. So that led to the develop an active cloth, a body suit. Because uh, typically if you take your regular cotton cloth, that actually do the damage rather than protect it. Because it soaks your entire pesticide solution, it keeps on your skin for a longer period of time. It acts as a reservoir for pesticide. So that's why people get more exposure rather than uh, preventing. So that's why we develop this chemically modified fabric which can suit into uh, or stitch into body suit and the mask. But this fabric has the ability to chemically again decompose every pesticide that comes into contact. It acts as a chemical scissor. Now they can wear this entire body suit and wear all the exposure part, like you know, palms and all, they can apply skin. So together, they can have 100% protection. And again, we have done the series of experiments to show that, uh, in fact, this fabric is active, it can be protected. And not only that, another critical parameter is affordability, because you are talking about you know, farmers who the purchase power is very low, but need to keep that in mind. So that's why we have designed this fabric in such a way that it's a reusable fabric, it's not disposable. And it can stay for up to 100 washes, it can stay active. And technically, if you use potentially one suit, they can use one year without any damage. So that's why we are now, but like, you know, again, after developing the technology, that brings to, that's not the end of the story, right? That brings to the fourth rule of the Pinta translational science, that is be flexible in your approach. Right? 
Uh, so one important thing I want to show here, this is the classical depiction of the clinical value of death that exists in clinical translational research. And it is ironic that majority of the uh, scientific breakthroughs, they remain in the laboratory, they are not able to cause this value of death to reach people to solve the other clinical needs. Right? So, but the good news is that gap can be bridged uh, between these two ends by practicing a very successful entrepreneurship program. Right? So, because your scientific breakthroughs that need to be converted into a viable product to reach to the end user. So, uh, this can be done through ways. Either, like, you know, uh, academic scientists, we come with a, like, a limited skill set, right? So, we might not be able to uh, uh, pass through this entire path. So, that's where either you learn the basic skills of this entrepreneurship and the build a team with the best business team who can do much better job than you do and team up and convert these technologies into viable products. So that's one of the approach we regularly practice in our laboratory. So that brings back to me, like my flashback takes me more than 20 years back, like when I was in college. I was super passionate uh, about business and entrepreneurship. In fact, like a, my whole family had a very hard time make me study. Like uh, my attendance was 10% in college. So in fact, I took like a three years break at a different stage try my best to leave the science, leave the education, and start uh, becoming the full-time entrepreneur. But my fate has uh, decided something else. So uh, due to several other reasons, I had to start, uh, put lid on my plans of becoming a full-time entrepreneur and go back to the education and pursue my science. But like, as I, I, I truly believe one thing, like it's never too late to be whomever you want to be, right? So I think recently you might have heard Apna Time Ayaga. Right. So we do get our time, so just wait for your time, right? So then I pursued my career in science and became like, you know, a passionate scientist where we develop deep uh, technology-based uh, innovations to solve all unmet clinical needs. But my uh, childhood dream or like a teenager dream or desire to become a full-time entrepreneur that is still hunting, right? That because uh, the aim was to become an entrepreneur to create wealth and jobs, right? So then I think now we are wise enough to merge these two approaches. So I took the science and entrepreneur, became a science entrepreneur. So what we do is that in a science, you develop technologies, this completely innovative technologies to solve one of clinical needs, to improve the quality of people of life. But as an entrepreneur, your focus is to develop the business with societal impact. It not only creates wealth, but like it also creates the social, societal impact. That's the regular practice what we do in our laboratory regularly. So, just applying this four-step rule, like you know, we could able to develop these technologies in your either skin gel or protective clothing to protect uh, these technologies and take convert that into uh, reality. We have formed a startup company in Bangalore with an amazing setup business team, and uh, where we are doing the clinical trials to take this technology further to launch it. And because our mission is to protect every single farmer in India and developing countries from this pesticide reduced toxic and lethality. And as I mentioned, like uh, all these four golden rules, we need to keep practicing if you want to do the successful clinical translational research over and over. So that's like our mantra in I'm glad everybody practices. By putting this together, we could able to develop a gamut of technologies. For example, like uh, very recently we have identified that we all in pomegranate juice. So when you have right set of pomegranate juice, right set of microbiome uh, that reside in our gut, that develops a particular molecule, we have identified that some of these active molecules have the better drug-like properties to, you know, for the treatment of ulcerative colitis. And similarly, we, <coughs> we develop the technologies where post-transplantation, because once you get the organ transplantation done, and our bodies try to reject uh, thinking that it's a foreign organ, right? So that's why people have to control your immune system to prevent rejection episodes in a, a transplantation organ. So we have been developing uh, novel biomaterials to improve the quality of life by preventing the rejection episodes in transplanted organs. And another technology what we have developed is like uh, where if you have the colitis and all, like the Crohn's and colitis disorders, where you are large and small intestine, you have patches of ulcers. And today, all the people, they take drugs or like very non-specific manner, you take a pill, 
your healthy tissue also get the same amount of dose than your ulcer tissue, right? And because of that, you have huge side effects. So that's why there are multiple drugs called off from the market because of this non-specific toxicity. Now we have developed this nanotechnology-based targeting delivery mechanism where uh, it stables in the entire GI tract, but it doesn't interact with your healthy tissue. But wherever you see the ulcer tissue, it goes and specifically binds like a gun and release the drug only at the site of inflammation. So that takes care of our entire side effects that are associated with the classical therapy today. So like that, we have been developing variety of technologies and all these technologies have been patented and now based on this technology led to the formation of four startup companies. One is in Bangalore, two are in uh, US and one is in Paris. And there are various stages of the, of the uh, development process. We already launched four products uh, throughout the world based on these technologies. And I have to say that you know, we try to balance uh, science, innovative science and the business together because all these four companies now have uh, raised more than you know, 1,000 crores of net worth and it created more than 100 uh, jobs today. I think that's where like, we wanted to focus uh, developing a business which had the societal impact because our end goal is to do a high quality clinical translational research to improve the quality of life of people. Thank you.